What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here. Welcome to day 289 of the 365 day graphic novel review challenge. Today I want to talk to you about JLA Strength in Numbers. Uh, this collects issues 24 through 33 of the JLA series uh, that was going on in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, this has a story by Grant Morrison and uh, Howard Porter uh, that introduces the Ultramarine Corps. Uh, we saw them in a brief one panel cameo in the DC 1 million crossover and uh, this story in a lot of ways actually builds off of uh, something that happened in the DC 1 million crossover. So if you are reading Grant Morrison's Justice League and for some reason you wanted to skip the DC 1 million crossover, I would strongly recommend that you go and read it before you read this storyline because uh, the main thrust of this particular part of this volume is built off of something that happens in the DC 1 million crossover. Uh, it's a little bit of a red herring, uh, but it is mentioned several times in this story. Uh, so I would recommend that you read DC 1 million before you read this story here. And uh, this also uh, kind of uh, has some seeds that are later picked up by Morrison once again a few years after he left Justice League the first time uh, he did a storyline in the uh, Justice League classified uh, which was happening around uh, around the time when he started Batman I think uh, maybe just a year or two earlier uh, but uh, so some of this stuff is stuff that you will see a little later on uh, in the Justice League classified arc uh, called the Ultra Marine Corps actually and then uh, we get a little two-part uh, fill-in story written by Mark Millar I'm assuming this is back when Morrison and Millar were still on speaking terms around the early 2000s as when those two kind of went their separate ways and weren't friends anymore, but at this time, I believe they were still friends, and uh, this is a very clever story, uh, not really in any way like anything uh, by Mark Millar that I've read. A lot of times, uh, he is prone to giving into his excesses, uh, trying to make everything as extreme and taboo as he possibly can. This story isn't really like that. I feel like uh, Millar, in the same way that Grant Morrison uh, has this great love for the Silver Age, I think Millar does also. I think that uh, he has a sense of respect for the Justice League uh, that he might not have uh, whenever he's working on other books where he feels like he can let loose a little bit more. Uh, but that story has this little debate between Superman and Batman on whether they should expand the ranks of the Justice League. Uh, we've seen that Superman pretty much this entire run has been wanting to increase their numbers a little bit, bolster their ranks a little bit, and we see that he still wants to do that. Batman is a little bit cautious. He doesn't really think that they should just make the team an unlimited team. And then we get to see that little B-plot tie into the A-plot that involves Amazo. And I won't tell you how that's resolved. Uh, I think it's a very clever story uh, and it reintroduces the Atom into the team. Uh, I don't think that we see him again in this run uh, but uh, he was there just kind of as an advisor. Uh, he wasn't there to be a full-time member of the league uh, so it's okay if we don't see him again but it is a little weird that we get to see him join the team and then we don't get to see him do anything once he does join the team. Uh, but then after that we get a story that is very evocative of the old Justice Society Justice League team up stories from the 1960s and after Crisis on Infinite Earths where we finally had the Justice Society and the Justice League living on the same world, uh, we no longer saw any of those team-ups anymore. It's weird, whenever they were living on separate worlds, we would see a team-up between these two teams every year, and then once they're on the same world, it just kind of goes away. Uh, so finally, I think this is the first time that we get to see these two teams actually team up with each other since Crisis on Infinite Earths. I know that they were uh, involved in some of the same stories. I think uh, Armageddon 2001, uh, or one of its follow-up stories, I believe, featured the Justice Society a little bit, uh, but this is the first actual team up between these two teams that isn't a big summer crossover or anything like that. Uh, but uh, I really like this story. Uh, I used to be a huge fan of those team-ups. Uh, I read the first like three or four volumes of Crisis on Multiple Earths uh, whenever I was first getting into DC Comics. I absolutely loved the Justice Society. I loved that there was this team that I didn't really know anything about. Uh, even before I was as well-versed in Superman and Batman as I am now, I felt like I knew those characters. And if I wanted to, I could read anything about those characters. I couldn't throw a rock and not hit a Batman comic in a comic book shop. But the Justice Society, they felt like something special because uh, it was a lot harder to get to the stories about them. Uh, whenever I was first getting into DC Comics, there was the Justice Society series that was started by David Goyer and uh, Jeff Johns, which actually kind of sort of spins out of uh, this crossover story. Uh, but uh, I felt like those uh, Crisis on Multiple Earths trade paperbacks were a really great way to get to these characters that had a sense of history that was somehow forbidden for me uh, to get to because uh, there aren't any collections of, say, the old Golden Age Dr. Midnight stories or anything like that. Uh, so uh, I really love this crossover, and it feels very epic. It feels like it warrants the teaming up between these two groups. It's not something uh, really small and petty that just the Justice Society uh, could handle on their own. Uh, this feels like it needs both of these teams together uh, to battle uh, the forces that are at work here. Uh, and I really like this. Uh, like I said, it kind of sort of leads into the Justice Society series, but kind of not. Uh, we had a brand new Justice Society 
Society series that started after this, but it doesn't really reference the events here. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things that kind of brings the two teams together is a new person who is controlling Johnny Thunder's Thunderbolt. Uh, his name is Jacob Thunder, and uh, we don't see him again for like four volumes in the Justice Society series, but here it's kind of implying that he is going to be their protege and he's going to be watched over by the uh, elder statesmen of the Justice Society. So uh, it's a little weird uh, that this is kind of a backdoor pilot for the JSA, but then uh, that doesn't really reference what's going on in this book uh, whenever we finally do get to the JSA series. And then we get uh, two issues that are both kind of sort of tied in with the uh, No Man's Land storyline uh, that was going on around this time, and those are both written by Mark Wade. Uh, the first one uh, kind of sort of ties in with some of the stuff that Wade was doing on JLA Year One, which was happening right around this time, and uh, it does a pretty good job of not making you go and read JLA Year One before you read this story, but at the same time, if you haven't read JLA Year One and suddenly you see Aquaman and Wonder Woman uh, talking about uh, this uh, evil team, uh, this uh, organization called Locus uh, from uh, JLA Year One, you're a little bit confused, and it's like, wait a minute, uh, I've been reading uh, this series this whole time, and I haven't heard anything about these guys, and then you see the little footnote that says uh, JLA Year One, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, so I wouldn't say that you have to read JLA Year One, uh, but uh, I do think that it might help you whenever you're reading this little tie-in issue. Uh, but it also uh, kind of ties in with the No Man's Land thing. Uh, it's a little weird, uh, because when you read No Man's Land, Batman feels like he is just uh, almost stretched too thin uh, trying to save his city, but then here, it feels like Batman is everywhere at once. He's helping the League fight uh, this evil Thunderbolt from the Fifth Dimension, and then uh, he's over here uh, helping uh, fight Amazo, and then, oh, by the way, we've also got this earthquake in Gotham City. That's another thing that he's dealing with. So, it's a little weird uh, that he's in Gotham City uh, trying to help bring the city back to normal, and then Huntress is asking Superman, why isn't the Justice League helping us restore order to the city? And I would think that Huntress knows Batman well enough to know that Batman does not want the Justice League helping him. In No Man's Land, Superman actually came and tried to help, and Batman said, no, I don't want you here. Uh, so that's a little bit of a weird thing. It almost feels like Mark Wade wasn't really reading the No Man's Land stuff that was going on at this time. I don't know. I can't say that for sure. It just feels that way. Uh, but anyway, uh, I like this book quite a bit. Uh, I think that this is maybe my favorite from this entire run just because of the Justice League, uh, Justice Society team up. Uh, there is a little weird thing. One of the minor bad guys of the story is a guy named Triumph, who apparently uh, was a superhero who was part of the Justice League in a Justice League Task Force issue. A Justice League Task Force was a uh, title that was going on in the 90s. I've never read any of it. Apparently, he was a member of the Justice League. He keeps saying that he was a founding member. I don't know if this is one of those things, kind of like the Century from Marvel Comics, where they claim that he has this backstory connected to all these characters who have been around for 50 years, but in actuality, he was just created in the 1990s. I don't know if it's kind of like that, or if he actually does have some kind of backstory with them. It's a little weird, uh, talking about JLA Year One earlier, uh, that uh, when you go and read that, Triumph is nowhere to be seen. And then he's talking here about how he is a founding member of the Justice League. That's a little strange. Uh, I guess I would have to go and read those Justice League Task Force issues to figure out what's going on there. Uh, but overall, I really like this book. I would have to say it's probably my favorite out of all of them, just because of the Justice Society Justice League team up. But it's still really good, even when you take away my nostalgia uh, that is affecting my bias uh, for this series. Uh, so anyway, uh, really great volume. Uh, I recommend that you guys check it out. Uh, and tomorrow, I will be back with another video where I will be talking about something else. In the meantime, you guys have a great rest of the day. Catch you later.